Hello, and welcome to the Commander Theory Podcast. I'm Nick Beatman, and I'm here with my friend, Zach Mack. Hello, everybody. So today, we're going to be talking about an issue that's going to be a bit more relevant with the release of Kaldheim. Kaldheim injects more changelings into magic, and while they're a great tool for tribal decks that don't have enough members, they can also push out solid members of a tribe if a tribal commander is designed carelessly. Today, we're going to be talking about which tribal commanders are most susceptible to changeling displacement, which successfully avoid the problem, and how this can inform future design. But before we jump in, I want to briefly talk about our Patreon. If you head on over to patreon.com slash commander theory, you can support the show and get sweet benefits for as little as $1 a month. If you aren't ready to be a patron yet, you can help us out by rating or reviewing us on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. All right, with that, let's jump into it. We're going to start by talking about commanders that suffer from the changeling problem. Commanders where all those those cool members of the tribe just aren't as good as changelings for whatever reason. And there's a couple different factors that can contribute to this. I think one of the, the best poster children for this problem is Unesh Cryosphinx Sovereign. So Unesh is four blue-blue, so six mana, for a legendary creature Sphinx with flying... Sphinx spells you cast cost two less to cast. Whenever Unesh or another Sphinx enters the battlefield under your control, reveal the top four cards of your library. An opponent separates those cards into two piles, put one pile into your hand and the other into your graveyard. So I think that the Sphinx cost reduction is definitely like a good tribal reward for this tribe. Sphinxes are an iconic creature type and as such they tend to be relatively expensive getting your six drops down to four mana is a pretty big bonus but i think it's really the second half of the card that's contributing to the problem do you want to talk a bit about that yes yeah, so one of the payoffs that unesh has is that whenever you have another swing center the battlefield you get this trigger and what that basically means is that any other characteristics of being a sphinx don't really contribute to that it doesn't really matter that sphinxes fly or that they're blue or that they're big it just matters that they entered the battlefield that that's how you're getting rewarded for putting a bunch of sphinxes into your list so what ends up happening is that it really pushes down the cmc of sphinxes you want and even though sphinxes are an iconic creature type even though sphinxes are a big flying like bashing kind of game ending creature it really kind of punishes you for playing sphinxes that cost seven and six mana and rewards you for playing sphinxes that you can find that might cost four or three or even less mana which is kind of where the changeling problem steps in here because as far as i know there aren't really any sphinxes that are actually three mana (laughs) yes there's one that has like surge for three mana but yeah for the most part definitely the case that they all tend to be at least they generally tend to be at least four mana. And the thing is, like the cheaper your Sphinxes are, the less mana you're putting into getting this trigger, the more you're able to get it in a single turn, the the faster you're able to churn through your deck, refill your hand. So it's it's the really cheap cards that can trigger it, like your changelings, that are contributing to your ability to kind of combo off with this commander. And you can see that when you look on the EDH rec page. If you scroll down to the creatures, you're going to see universal automaton which is a single mana for uh, an artifact creature shapeshifter with changeling you're going to see a shape sharer which is a two mana changeling you're going to see moth dust changeling you're going to see a meboid changeling all of these creatures that don't really share many characteristics with most sphinxes they don't really have anything to do with sphinxes but because they count as sphinxes they end up making a, a significant portion of these decks when we talk about tribal rewards, and we're going to talk about that a decent amount on this episode, being that it's changelings, like as cool as Unesh is, and like as cool as the cost reduction part of the tribe is, just because sphinxes are big and a cost reduction helps you cast them, this, it just isn't a suitable reward for what sphinxes are, and that that's really just going to be a problem that keeps popping up. Like 
the fact that Unesh just looks and is like, mm, yeah, blob of jelly, delicious. And then like keeps uh-huh. rolling, really kind of like takes away from the coolness that is Sphinxes and like Sphinxes as a tribe. Yeah, I think it just speaks to like a pretty important principle of design, which is that the fun thing should be the most powerful thing. And I think like people who really like Sphinxes, it would be better if the Sphinx tribal commander was something that allowed you to run all of your cool Sphinxes like Sphinx of Uthun and Consecrated Sphinx and Chancellor of the Spires, rather than something that makes you run these like ugly alien babies from Lorwyn. Yeah, or the grape jelly ones from Modern Horizons. Yeah, exactly. So I I think that that's just a problem with this design. But if you're ready, I think we can move on to another example of a commander that is also suffering from the changeling problem. This one always really gets me. So this is Colagon, uh, the first Colagon, the Storm's Fury. Uh, So Colagon is a 4-5 flying dragon for 5 mana, 3 black red. And has, whenever a dragon you control attacks, creatures you control get plus one, plus zero until end of turn. Colagon also has dash, which was uh, a mechanic that's uh, pay its dash cost. You can cast it at gains haste and then you bounce it into turn. And the dash cost is exactly equal to this casting cost, so three black red. So the idea was that you could drop in Colagon really quickly, dash, buff your team, and then Colagon goes back to your hand and is like safe to do it again. And you can do this over and over again as long as you're willing to pay the five mana every turn for the effect. But in Commander, this trigger is like rewarding dragons attacking, buffing your team at five mana is not super appropriate for dragons. Dragons tend to be pretty big and can kind of end the game without too much help. So what gets put into this? deck list bunch of tiny creatures that really can benefit from this plus one plus oh yeah yeah i i definitely want to like focus on what you just said there which is like dragons tend to be expensive and they tend to be big so casting like a six drop five five dragon and having it get a buff of plus one plus oh is proportionally a lot less powerful than playing a one one changeling for one and having it get that same plus one plus one bonus and then of course like because there's these these big difference in mana costs because all the dragons cost so much it's just way more difficult to get multiple triggers off of your colagon if you're restricting yourself to real dragons to non-changeling dragons but you know when changelings cost one two three mana you can curve your changelings just cast a changeling on one two three four and colagon and get five triggers plus five plus O to all of your guys. And that's just like way more damage being dealt earlier in the game than if you go something like, I'll play nothing on turns one through three. I'll play a dragon on turn four, a Colagon on turn five, another dragon on turn six. Maybe that one has haste and I get plus three plus O to my three guys instead of plus five plus O to my five guys. Again, it takes away from the coolness of the tribe. Like, I think in some ways it's clever. In some ways you can look and go like, haha, isn't this funny? Like, I'm making all of these green babies hit really hard and I'm I'm able to utilize this trigger in a way that probably wasn't necessarily intended. But it also just means that the actual dragons and actual, like, coolness of the tribe that this card is referencing don't ever come through and always feel a little bit worse than kind of building it in the optimal play pattern, which is kind of a bummer. Yeah, because, you know, if you look on the EDH rec page for Colagon the Storm's Fury and scroll down to the creatures, you're going to see Torian Mahler, you're going to see Changeling Outcast, you're going to see Graveshifter, you're going to see Venomous Changeling, and you're going to see our good pal Universal Automaton. Totally agree. It's unfortunate that this card is designed in such a way that it doesn't make use of the tribe's strengths. Which is going to be a theme, so do you want to get to this next one, which I think is a little bit different than... Okay, well, this one's a little strange, yeah. I I, I definitely agree this is a bit weirder. Yeah. (laughs) So this next card is Atla Palani Nest Tender, and Atla Palani is one Naya, so one red, green, white, for a 2-3 legendary creature human shaman. She has two tap, create a 0-1 green egg creature token with defender, 
and whenever an egg you control dies, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature card. Put that card onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Uh, it, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to like make generalizations about this because it's such a unique effect. Yeah, um, and the deck it builds into is like very unique among tribal lists in that you're not really attacking with your eggs, but you're you're essentially just comboing off because if you have like a sacrifice outlet, if you play like a sacrifice outlet on turn two, um, an egg or a changeling on turn three, and then Atla Palani on turn four, and your entire deck is just like changelings and uh, some Eldrazi Titan that shuffles your graveyard back into your library, then basically you will probably win from there. All, all you need, you've got like a 50-50 chance that Irregular Cohort is in your library above your Eldrazi Titan. And if that's the case, then like the first time you combo off, you'll basically make it so that you sacrifice your eggs over and over and reshuffle them over and over uh, as many times as you want and just generate infinite of whatever your sack outlet provides. Again, this card, like, you know, eggs do have some characteristics. A lot of them have zero power. A lot of them have defender. But this card doesn't care about any of that. It's just looking for that word on the type line or the changeling ability in the text box. This is probably the weirdest case we're going to talk about today, where the reward for playing an egg is like it slots into a machine as opposed to like an actual reward where like you get cards or you get power or you get mana or something like that just because it really does feel like a machine it really does feel like oh if egg then continue mm -hmm. <laughs> or there's not really anything special to the build it's just like if i do this then this will happen i'm gonna put in the cheapest versions of this to make the other thing happen as efficiently as possible i mean i think it's a unique deck i think it's just very strange also that it ended up being the case that changelings work so well <laughs> yeah yeah definitely an odd one but i think the other uh tribal commanders we're going to be talking about today are a bit more conventional if you don't mind i'd, I'd like to move on to the next one which is ayula queen among bears mm -hmm, fan favorite indeed uh bear force one so ayula is one and a green for a two two legendary creature bear whenever another bear enters the battlefield under your control choose one Put two plus one plus one counters on target bear or target bear you control fights target creature you don't control. Ayula just really wants to get this ETB trigger as easily as possible. Bears do have a lot of characteristics in common. They tend to be uh, two twos, often for two. They're, they're almost all green. They're generally small in size. If they're not exactly a 2-2, they might be like a 3-3, but they don't get much larger than that. But this design doesn't particularly care about all that. It just cares about whether a bear is entering the battlefield, in which case changelings can do that job just fine. And I think in this instance, one of the problems with Ayula is you want to farm this trigger as much as possible because it is a very good trigger. It's like grow a bear or a bear fight something. And the problem with this is that it ignores the fact that there's just not that many bears. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's one of the, the misses here with Ayula is that he has a meme card. It like hits the mark perfectly. It is a 2-2 two, two for 2 and it cares about bears. But if you're going to make a bunch of bears or play with a bunch of bears, you're going to have to play with a bunch of vanilla 2-2s two or vanilla 4-2s and... Vanilla 4-2s aren't known to win many games of Commander. Mm -hmm. So you just kind of have to just put as many bears and bear makers in your list as possible. And it turns out that some of the best, most efficient ones are simply just changelings. Yeah. Looking at this deck list, one of the top creatures listed with 55% of the 1,200 Ayula decks, uh, you've got Chameleon Colossus. And Universal Automaton is in 46% of these decks. Game Trail Changeling is in 45% of these decks. Uh, we've got Changeling Titan. We've got Web Weaver Changeling. All seeing a lot of play in these Ayula lists. So really, I wouldn't be surprised if some of these bears were, you know, some of the bears available were just getting pushed out 
buy these changelings just because they're more efficient or they're bigger bodies or whatever. When a changeling also does something... So, I mean, in the case of Chameleon and Colossus, there, there are other bears that are four mana and they do a lot less than Chameleon Colossus. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, of course, like when you're weighing the options between a bear that is just going to sit there, or maybe fight something, put two plus one plus one counters on something, or a bear that's going to do the exact same thing and also has protection from black and also can grow and like one shot somebody like you're going to play the one that has a lot more utility because you already are getting all the other bonuses from it. There's not that extra little bit that pushes it over the edge. I mean, I think this next one also has, uh, we're going to say very similar things to Ayula uh, on, which is, uh, can I read this one off? Sure, go for it. So this next one we're talking about is Lathless Dragon Queen. So this is a commander that came out in M19, a mono red dragon commander. She costs six mana, four red red. She has flying, she's a six six. And she has the trigger whenever another non-token dragon enters the battlefield under your control, create a 5-5 red dragon creature token with flying. And she also has this ability, one red dragons you control get plus one plus oh until end of turn. So kind of fire breathing for all of your dragons. And this is kind of a one of the things, this is kind of between Ayula and Unesh here with Lathless where you don't care what the dragon does you just care that it's entering because the trigger is so powerful so what ends up happening is you again just are pushed to play as cheap of dragons as possible because if your entire game plan starts at six cmc then you just what you let your opponents just do whatever for five turns and then hope you hit all your land drops and try to win then that that doesn't sound like a, a pretty well put together plan yeah like if your game plan is i'm gonna cast lathless on turn six turn seven i will cast my hellkite charger and get an additional five five and then turn eight let me tell you what i'm gonna do it's like no this is not how you're gonna win a game of commander the pressure of this design is for you to cast lathless as you know as soon as possible and then cast like Universal Automaton, Firebelly Changeling, Torian Mauler get like 15 or 20 power worth of five, five worth of dragons in a single turn. And that's just going to be a much more powerful strategy. Again, it's just kind of washing over all of the things that make dragons cool and only caring about channeling them into this pipeline of like, play dragon, get reward, play dragon, get reward. And kind of, it kind of bumps me out. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think that's just kind of the nature of the design. Like, and, and also it's worth noting that going wide and playing a lot of cheap things that count as dragons is also a better way to make good use of this fire breathing ability. Like if you play Lathless and then you play one six cost dragon, your fire breathing is going to give you a total of plus two power across your guys. But if you play Lathless and then play like three things that count as dragons, then that fire breathing ability is going to give you, you know, plus four, plus O oh, across your your guys. So really both halves of this card just encourage you to run the cheapest possible things that count as dragons as opposed to caring about like dragons being large or having flying or being expensive. This is just going to be this repeating theme where it, when you don't look at what the tribe is doing, you are going to end up in this weird place where you're just not rewarding anything properly. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I, I think if we can move on to this last one too, this is like the poster child of that. Yeah. This is Reaper King. So Reaper King is a 6-6 six, six legendary artifact creature scarecrow. They cost, so two brit is two generic and a color. So they cost two brit white, two brit blue, two brit black, two brit red, two brit green. Other scarecrow creatures you control get plus one plus one. And whenever another scarecrow uh, enters the battlefield under your control, destroy target permanent. Just straight up vindicate something. (laughs) Man, I'm going to need you. I don't know if you have the EDH rec page open. If not, I'll I'll read this out. But yeah. (laughs) We, we got to go over these high synergy cards here. And I'll just read you the, the creatures on this line. But number one for high synergy cards, Irregular Cohort. We've also got Torian Mauler, Grave Shifter, Unsettled Mariner, Changeling Outcast, Changeling Berserker, Mirror Entity, Moth Dust Changeling. There are zero actual Scarecrows 
on this list of high synergy cards, which is astounding. Like some of these tribal commanders, you can see a little bit of resistance against falling into this changeling trap. Like Lathless, I think, but Reaper King has just fallen down that hole completely. Like if you are building Reaper King, it is a changeling deck more than I think any of the other tribal commanders we've talked about so far. Yeah, definitely. And, and of course, like that's it's largely because there's a lot of expensive scarecrows out there that are just harder to fit into the deck than like these one and two cost changelings that just so easily get you this ETB trigger that you care about. One day if we actually see appropriate Scarecrow Tribal, like Scarecrows are really cool and they can be really creepy. They're used in a lot of horror movies. They do have interesting characteristics. The fact that they're in magic, they're pretty much always artifact creatures. That alone gives them some mechanical hooks to build off of. And on that note, they're also usually very creepy on the magic art mm -hmm. because they're supposed to be scary. You know, like they're supposed to be this thing that kind of lurks in the fields outside. So to me, it's kind of a bummer that we just ended up with a deck that is supposed to be rewarding scarecrows, this really cool, like pretty resonant creature type. And instead of that, instead of getting a bunch of cool scarecrows and like the scarecrows working together to accomplish something, it's like a bunch of jelly babies yeah kind of hitting the battlefield yeah no it's it's so unfortunate that changeling outcast is seeing more play than all these like really awesome creepy scarecrows like one-eyed scarecrow field creeper tatter kite lure bound scarecrow it was just so many of these designs that have like incredible iconic art but it's just not correct to play them over your your grape jelly man yeah and that is not to say that the power level of this deck is not high. Like, I think one of the things about Reaper King is that it is such a strong deck. Like, it's five color, you have access to whatever you need. And then on top of that, you're vindicating things constantly. Mm -hmm. So it's not to say that, like, Reaper King is suffering or that Reaper King would be a better deck power level wise if there were more scarecrows in it. But it really does not benefit the tribe that Reaper King is designed the way it is. So I, I think that's a pretty big distinction to make here too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, with that, I think we can change gears a little bit. Let's talk about some of the, the best tribal designs that really don't end up with changelings in the deck. The commanders that can hone in on what their tribe is doing so well that it isn't worth your while to put changelings in there. Yeah, so again, I think if you're listening, you'll be able to find a theme with these. So can I get going on this first one? Yes, go right ahead. So this first commander is Azuri Renegade Leader. So, I mean, you, you've probably seen an Azuri if you've been playing for a while. Azuri is a 2-2 elf warrior for one green green. They have green regenerate another target elf and two green green green, so five mana. Elf creatures you control get plus three plus three and gain trample until end of turn. So... This is an elf deck, and you care about elves, and you, you protect your elves, and you buff your elves, and how, what are the high synergy cards for this list look like? Uh, well, unsurprisingly, they're all elves. Uh, you, got yeah. your, you got your Elvish Archdruid, you've got Marwyn the Nurturer, Imperius Perfect, Lisa Lana Huntmaster, Dwin and Guiltleaf Dane, Priest of Titania, Elvish Champion, Wirewood Channeler, Wellwisher, just all the cards that you really think of when you think of elves and that's really what i think tribal designs should lend themselves to because it sucks when you know all of the cool cards you think of for your scarecrow deck or your dragon deck are incorrect to run and you like feel like you're you're not not building optimally uh when you put them in your deck but here this this design aligns with what you really want to be doing with your elves which is like you know, going wide, making a bunch of tokens, adding a ton of mana, all of this feeds into what Azuri is doing because like he is a mana sink for all your elf mana and he pumps your guys. So all those elf tokens you're generating get a lot larger and it just kind of multiplies the benefit that he gives you. Yeah. And, and I think this is something that I've been noticing testing with a lot of the new elf commanders that they've been putting out and trying to brew with them is that it really does hone into what, or, or Azuri really does hone into what elves do, which is just make just a metric crap ton of mana. 
And something I've found with some of the newer elf commanders that don't necessarily have mana sinks like built into them is that I'll like sit there and I'll look at my board and I'll be like, well, I can make 16 mana right now, but what do I do with it? Yeah, yeah. I had that issue when I was te testing my Lathril list. There'd be times where like, oh my God, I'm making so many tokens and I have this Priest of Titania. I could make so much mana, but I just do not have anything to do with it. And Azuri would, would just be the perfect solution for this situation mm -hmm. looking at that azuri is still to this day one of the strongest elf commanders just because he gives you something to do with your mana you're like well i just have a bunch of weird one ones and two twos and sometimes they get buffed but for the most part i'm just making 20 mana a turn so uh why don't i overrun four <laughs> times <laughs> It just kind of gives you an answer to the thing that the tribe is doing and doing very well. So I think Azuri is like a, a great elf design, like almost a perfect commander in that regard. Yeah. And looking through like all the creatures in this list, there's no changelings anywhere in there. It's just all sweet elves, uh, which is perfect. Mm -hmm. The next one also kind of is in the similar vein. I guess this is kind of a dual Thing we're going to be talking about i mean both of these commanders they reward the same tribe and they kind of reward the same things about the tribe but I'll, I'll read this one off first it is inala archmage ritualist two blue black red for a four five legendary creature human wizard she has eminence and whenever another non-token wizard enters the battlefield under your control if inala is in the command zone or on the battlefield you may pay one if you do create a token that's a copy of that wizard the token gains haste Exile it at the beginning of the next end step. And she also has tap five untapped wizards you control. Target player loses seven life. What's the other commander that kind of fits in this same vein? Yeah, so the other one, also a wizard commander, is Nabon, Dean of Iteration. So Nabon is a two mana, two one human wizard. And they have the ability, if a wizard entering the battlefield under your control causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. You double up on your wizard triggers. So both of them kind of play in the same space, as you could sort of tell, which is rewarding the wizards that enter the battlefield and do something. Or in the case of Inala, like also enables you to use like your activated abilities the first turn they come in. But they, they're really building around the strengths of the tribe. And even looking at the Inala list, the high synergy cards and the wizards in the high synergy cards are for the most part just like ETB triggers. Like you got your Archaeomancer, you got your Dual Caster Mage, Se Seagate Oracle, Narumeha, Master Wizard, all those kinds of things. And Nabon is in fact like one of the highest synergy cards in the Inala list. So there's clearly a lot of synergy between those two. Most of these wizards that you're running in these lists, you know, have powerful abilities that synergize with the commanders. And so like the there's pretty much no benefit to running changelings in these decks. And you can sort of see that just looking at the creatures listed in these commanders. They're, they all are, are powerful and do things. And of course, some of that benefit is just the fact that you're able to pull from all these sweet, you know, hundreds and hundreds of wizards that have been printed over the years. But there's just no reason to run even like a universal automaton because there's very little benefit to just having a cheap wizard it's all about what the wizards themselves do. Yeah, and they do all sorts of things. Like, wizards just, they, they bounce things. A lot of them draw cards. They, like, scry. They tap things down. They get back instants and sorceries. They flicker things. They, they just kind of, they copy spells. They're, they're doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And people are into that. It is fun gameplay. And when you let's say, get two times the tokens with your Master of Waves, then that feels pretty good, right? Like, you're you're kind of taken off with that. Or if you can go and get two three-drop artifacts with your Trophy Mage, that is basically just a combo mm -hmm. <laughs> right there. You just got, I guarantee you, a combo engine with two three-cost artifacts. There's so many of them that do that. Yep. So it just makes sense that giving wizards these kind of triggers or like doubling up on your wizard somehow like both of these commanders do would lead to a fun interesting wizard list mm -hmm. i think with that we can move on to the next commander that that doesn't need changelings and that is kalia of the vast 
So Kali of the Vast is one red, white, black for a 2-2 legendary creature human cleric. She has flying, and whenever Kali of the Vast attacks an opponent, you may put an angel, demon, or dragon creature card from your hand onto the battlefield, tapped and attacking that opponent. What I love about this ability is it's very aware of the characteristics of angels, demons, and dragons. And as we mentioned earlier when we were talking about Lathless, dragons tend to be pretty expensive, and that's also the case with angels and demons. They're all iconic creatures, and as a result, like you want an ability that helps you deal with that that big stumbling block of like how do I play with these six and seven cost cards before turn six and seven? And Kalia answers that question, and she does it in a way that really rewards running like the most expensive angels, demons, and dragons possible. Because when you're essentially reducing the cost of one of these creatures down to zero, you don't want to go from one to zero. You want to go from like seven or eight to zero just to get the the maximum power at, that this ability is offering you. So looking at this list, you're going to see Avacyn, Angel of Hope. You're going to see Gisela, Blade of Gold Knight. You're going to see Vilas, Broker of Blood, but you're not going to see Universal Automaton. And I think that just kind of goes to the design when they're looking at uh, Kalia as one of the original commander deck commanders. And I think when they were looking at what they could do in these wedges and they were looking at themes in these wedges, they went, oh, well, Mardu has a lot of big creatures. There's demons and dragons and angels. What if we made a commander that let you play with all of these big stupid things? That seems like something cool for a battle cruiser format. And they they did it. The, the Mad Men. <laughs> like they made a list where you can just jam in your favorite eight mana demon and it's really good <laughs> and that's that's great i think that's like kind of a great design philosophy and it kind of builds into the strength of like what you would want to happen when you just shove all of these really big creature types into your list yeah absolutely i think we can move on to the next one this is anawan the ruin thief so Anawan the Ruin Thief uh, is a new commander printed in the Zendikar Rising Commander decks. And he is two black blue for a 2-4 two th- two legendary creature vampire rogue. Other rogues you control get plus one plus one. Whenever one or more rogues you control deal combat damage to a player, that player mills a card for each one damage dealt to them. If the player mills at least one creature card this way, you draw a card. This really plays off of what is unique about rogues, which is that there have been so many rogues printed over the years that are just cheap and evasive. You've got your Slither Blades, you've got your Triton Shore Stalkers, you've got your Merfolk Wind Robber, and in fact, like looking all the way back to Morning Tide, a central element of Rogue Tribal was this Prowl ability, which requires you to deal combat damage to a player with a rogue. It really ties into what rogues have been doing mechanically for decades and as a result looking at the deck there is one notable changeling present which is changeling outcast but that's because it can't be blocked rather than just because it is a rogue like the you know 99 percent of the creatures listed in this this edh rec page are rogues first off and are cards that usually have evasion or have some other roguelike ability that synergizes with the commander so it's definitely not a commander for changelings it really is playing into the strengths of the tribe there's not too much to say about that it's just they really actually took a look at what rogues did and then they made it happen they made it work and kind of in that vein can i move on to the next commander yes yeah so the next commander is very similar it's ill not in in function but in design philosophy um this is gargos vicious watcher So Gargos is an 8-7 Hydra with Vigilance for 6 mana, 3 green, green, green. They have Hydra spells you cast cost 4 generic less to cast. Whenever a creature you control becomes the target of a spell, Gargos Vicious Watcher fights up to one target creature you don't control. So uh, a very different tribe, but I think a very appropriate tribal reward. Because what's the thing that hydras all have in common or a thing that most hydras have in common 
it's that they're big, they're splashy, they have X in the mana cost a lot of the time. So what if X was plus four? Mm -hmm. (laughs) What if your Hydra Omnivore costs two mana? (laughs) (laughs) That's the question that Gargos asked and answered, and it is pretty good. Yeah, with a design like this, it's it's really similar to Kalia in that with like an enormous cost reduction, uh, that really incentivizes going for the expensive members of the tribe. You want to get the max value out of that reduction. So you're not going to be putting like, you're not going to be excited about a zero cost universal automaton or a one cost woodland changeling. You're going to be super stoked about how you paid, like you said, two mana for your Hydra Omnivore or two mana for a Hydra Broodmaster or got a Voracious Hydra for X equals four by only paying two mana. So I think this is just a great design that works really well with the existing members of the tribe. And looking at this EDA Trek page, it is exactly what you would hope to be. Like all of the cool Hydras you want to play in Commander are here, are present in this deck. Mm -hmm. The big hitters, Colonian Hydra, Ulvenwald Hydra, there's the... The big expels one, uh, voracious Hydra, hungering Hydra, they're they're all here. They're all good. Hooded Hydra, Hydra Broodmaster. They're gonna smash face, and it's gonna work out pretty well for you. <laughs> yeah. So great design there, and I think we've got one last example of a a quality tribal commander design before we we're gonna go into like generalizing from these examples we've seen so far. Yeah, and and this one I think is notable because I I don't think people see this guy a lot around. He, a long time ago, did not work in Commander. Mm -hmm. (laughs) A long time ago, this Commander was not uh, playable because the color identity rule uh, said that he could not work. So this is Thelen of Havenwood. This is a 2-2 Elf Druid for 2 mana, uh, green green. Each fungus gets plus 1 plus 1 for each spore counter on it. And black, green, remove a fungus card in a graveyard from the game, put a spore counter on each fungus in play. So uh, I think that's been eroded to put a spore counter on each fungus on on the battlefield. You control on the battlefield, yeah. But yeah, this is a fungus commander. And uh, these days you don't see it too often. They haven't really printed like a traditional Thalid type creature in a very long time. But at one point in time this guy was pretty popular Mm -hmm. yeah and i love that you know he makes use of spore counters which is something that is unique to the fungus tribe looking at how they um, were designed back in fallen empires and then again in time spiral block this like cyclical get three spore counters to get you to that threshold where you can use the ability for something often making sapperlings he's building off of what the cards are already doing and although he does have that like built-in ability to add spore counters to your fungi if they naturally accrue spore counters they're just going to be much better in the deck so putting in a a woodland changeling or a universal automaton is not going to be nearly as good as your thalid shell dweller or your death spore thalid or or so on and so forth yeah and Kind of over the years, this has just kind of gotten better. Uh, Eventually, we got Corpse Jack Menace. I think that was kind of the heyday of when I was seeing this card was like Return to Ravnica. Um, But they're still printing funguses. We got Molder Hulk in uh, Return to Return to Ravnica. We have like Slime Put the Stowaway and like Spore Crown Thalid from Dominaria. So I don't think the prevalence of funguses or funguses and design is going to go away which means that i think felon is going to be better over time and we're getting things now a lot more like throwback sets so in particular like time spiral remastered is going to come out oh and we know we're getting a modern horizons 2 i wouldn't be surprised if we got more toys for felon that played with these spore counters and spore counter builds just because we're getting kind of these like throwbacky sets in the coming years even if there isn't like a, a fungus theme in Modern Horizons 2, I think that if they were to bring back the fungus uh, cards in Time Spiral Remastered and make that a part of that limited environment, I think that'll definitely bring some awareness to Thelen and maybe boost his popularity among the, the Golgari commanders. Yeah, because currently um, he's ranked uh, of all time 506, which is not the lowest, but uh, definitely not very high. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I think he's fallen a bit out of people's awareness. I think it is mostly because they have not been printing cards with sport counters in a while. It'd be interesting to see if they printed new cards with sport counters, if they work the same way or if they just like utilize them somehow. So with that, I think we can move on to some general rules. We're going to try to extrapolate from these examples we've seen so far. And then we're going to test those predictions by looking at a couple commanders that sort of fit into these categories that we're going to be making. Let me start off by saying like the first general rule is that if your tribe has a lot of high quality, cheap options or efficient token generation, you're going to get less competition from changelings. Changelings are more likely to be played in, in tribes that don't have a lot of good cheap options. So they, they tend to show up more in like the iconic creature type tribal decks. But some examples of tribes with a lot of high quality cheap options that we're going to use to test this prediction would be Jarena Kudro, which is a human tribal commander, and Sliver Legion, which is a sliver tribal commander. So humans are the most popular tribe. They have been printed on, on more creatures than anything else. And as a result, they've just accrued a lot of really high quality options especially at the lower end of the, the CMC scale over the years. Looking at Jarena's decklist, I am not seeing any changelings. There are just so many good humans printed across the years that there's not really a need to run them. Uh, and then slivers, of course. Almost every sliver is some sort of lord for the tribe. So cutting a, an actual lord for something that doesn't really add anything to the rest of your slivers seems kind of unlikely. And just looking at that Sliver Legion deck list, of course, we're not seeing any changelings. Or actually, sorry, that's not true. We see Mirror Entity yeah. <laughs> is, is uh, one changeling present, as well as Morophon the Boundless. But again, both of those kind of make sense here. Morophon, like it is a five color deck. Morophon does make your slivers cheaper and makes your commander, in fact, free. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas I Mirror Entity is just you're in a go wide deck and Mirandi allows to, you to pump all your guys. Yeah, and and while still maintaining synergy with the slivers. And yeah, I do think it is important to note that w in regards to slivers, like Morophon does make a lot of them free. A lot of the ones that you're going to be playing, most slivers cost like blue black or like blue green or something like that and either makes them like one mana, two mana, three mana when they might cost a lot more than that. So I... I totally see why Morphon is here and i think people who've maybe brewed a sliver list before will kind of know that it's pretty hard to cut <laughs> slivers sometimes like there's just kind of like an abundance of wealth like there's this embarrassment of riches where you are like oh i kind of have too many options and i'm gonna leave some slivers on the cutting room floor so to me that kind of really highlights this point that when you do have a lot of these high quality cheap guys then you're just not gonna put in your changelings there's no reason to mm -hmm. the next point i think is that when there is a large cost reduction that you end up with less competition from changelings so i mean we we saw this with gargos before but there's more examples of this so i think the first one is when we look at gishath sun's avatar so gishath sun's avatar is a 7-6 dinosaur avatar with Vigilance, Trample, and Haste for 8 mana, 5 red, green, white. But they have, whenever Gishath, Sun's Avatar, deals combat damage to a player, you reveal that many cards from the top of your library and put any dinosaurs you reveal onto the battlefield. So that that is the best kind of cost reduction, which is free. <laughs> <laughs> right? So... If you're getting free dinosaurs, you're not really going to want to run a bunch of cheap one, two, three drops. You're going to want to run your Zatalpas. You're going to want to run your Gorging Ceratopses and your Regisaur Alphas. You are going to want to run your Silver Clad Ferocidons, your eight mana dinosaurs that just really have a really high impact on what the game is doing. And you're going to want to cut basically the cheap ones and the changelings that don't fit your build and what you're trying to do and in fact i don't see any changelings on the edh rec page for gishath if you dig very so there's oh none yes there's a torian mauler way down there yeah so there's nothing in the high synergy there's nothing in the top cards if you dig way into the creatures there is a, a torian mauler yes but you know for the most part the vast majority of these cards 
are dinosaurs and it's it's definitely not one of those commanders where half the cards are changelings yeah yeah definitely builds into an actual dinosaur list Mm -hmm. and then the other one too uh that is just massive cost reduction is zirlin of the claw which is like i i love that deck i used to have this deck a long time ago so zirlin of the claw is a three four vaishino shaman for five mana three red red and they have one red red tap search your library for a dragon card and put it onto the battlefield with haste at the end of the turn exile that card that's it (laughs) so you you uh tutor up a dragon put it into play give it haste and then it gets exiled at the end of the turn you know me, I'm really going to be looking to put that uh, that changeling in there. That Torian Mauler is really good to hit him really quick and really, really early, right? Mm-hmm. No, no, it's not. Everything is a dragon. Everything is like a six mana dragon or more. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's, it's very, very much like a dragon player's deck. If you love mono red dragons, if you love dragons as a tribe, this deck is just like perfect for you. It's just like you always see your favorite dragons and they always do dragon things every time definitely a great way to um synergize with the fact that so many dragons are expensive and like they often have combat damage triggers or attack triggers so just like a good thoughtful design yep big boys hit and no changelings because why i think with that we can move on to the next category of cards that naturally disincentivize changelings and that's going to be non x tribal So we haven't seen a lot of this, but it was a little bit of a theme back in um, Dark Ascension, and it's a little bit of a theme in Throne of Eldraine, but we've had some non-human tribal commanders. And of course, anytime you put non-X, where X is a creature type, that's going to exclude changelings. Grumgully the Generous from Throne of Eldraine and Micaeus the Unhallowed both give you rewards for your non-human cards. And as a result, neither of them see any changelings in their lists i think this is a little bit more narrow in terms of um or maybe a little bit too broad in terms of design because it's less of a tribal deck and more of like anything but that tribe deck which is is not a huge restriction but it's still a good example of like a commander that cares about tribes and which keeps changelings from proliferating too far into the format i think both of those decks are strange i think that it's it's funny because both of those decks kind of lend themselves towards combo too so i am interested to see them use this technology a little bit more and see like where it goes in the future kind of that being said though can i move on to the next point yes the next kind of bullet point here is when you design around unique mechanical identities of the tribe so we saw this up above uh when we were looking at some of our examples but there's just less competition from changelings when you are attaching the tribal reward to something that the tribes do. So think Anawan above, but also think like Takeno, the samurai general, which you might not be super familiar with. It hasn't been played super a lot in the last few years, but Takeno samurai general is a 3-3 human samurai for six mana, five and a white, has Bushido two, and Bushido is whenever the creature blocks or is blocked it gets plus two plus two Uh, and it has each other samurai you control gets plus one plus one for each point of bushido it has so samurai in block had bushido and they would get really big with this guy out um just much larger than they should be for their cost and you know who doesn't have bushido (laughs) changelings (laughs) it just isn't gonna work yeah so i think this is a great design really I'd say like close to 100%, if not 100% of Samurais printed in Kamigawa block had Bushido. So that was just a great example of, well, I could give Samurais like just straight plus one plus one, or I could build off of something that is unique to Samurais and make it more flavorful and less likely to overlap with other things. So I think it's just a fantastic commander design and a really good way to build around the tribe. Mm -hmm. And in a similar vein, uh, another commander that we got from Kamigawa was Higure the Stillwind, which was the ninja commander. So Higure is a 3-4 human ninja for 5 mana, 3 blue-blue. They have ninjutsu for 2 blue-blue, so 4 mana. Whenever Higure the Stillwind 
deals combat damage to a player, you may search your library for a ninja card, reveal it, and put it into your hand. If you do, shuffle your library. And they also have two target ninja is unblockable this turn. When you end up looking at this list, there, I think there might be a changeling really far down on the page, but for the most part, they're picking up literal actual <laughs> ninjas because a lot of ninjas have on hit effects. That was one of the things they did. You kind of sneak by with a 1-1 one, one flyer or an unblockable dork that doesn't do much damage. And all of a sudden they're getting hit with a misplayed shinobi and they have to bounce a creature or ninja the deep hours hits them and they you get to draw a card or it could be all manner of like funny ninja stuff. We got semi recently in Modern Horizons Miss Syndicate Naga, which when it deals combat damage, you get a token of it uh, and is a Naga ninja, which is a hilarious type line. So this deck in particular is really, really rewarding you for putting a bunch of ninjas in your list and looking at their mechanical identity of like, I hit you, I get thing. Yeah, I love that about it because like one issue I've had just kind of playing around with like a Yuriko ninja tribal list is so many of these ninjas with ninjutsu don't naturally have don't naturally have evasion. So, you know, you get your initial hit in when you ninjutsu them, but getting hits in beyond that is a lot trickier. And Higure kind of helps you solve that problem by getting your ninjas in, making it so you're repeatedly able to farm that trigger. And I just really like that design. So the four rules we've talked about so far have all been uh, ways you can design tribal commanders to get less competition from changelings. That's like, you know, choosing a tribe that has a lot of high quality cheap options or efficient token generation, designing a commander that offers large cost reduction, choosing non-X tribal and designing around the unique mechanical identity of your tribe. So these next two we're going to be talking about are characteristics of commanders that lead to more competition from changelings, things that make it more likely that a deck is going to be full of these weird alien babies. Uh, so the first one we're going to be talking about is if you have just a, a simple, like whenever member of the tribe enters the battlefield or attacks, do something busted. That is probably going to lead to more competition from changelings because then you're just focusing on getting that enter the battlefield trigger or getting that attack trigger. And usually that's going to lead you down. Well, you know, this universal automaton is really cheap. It'll allow me to get this trigger efficiently. And so what's the first commander that we're going to use to test this trend that we think we've identified? Yeah, so this is a semi-new one from Jumpstart, so might need a refresher for some people. Sethron Herloon General is a 4-4 Minotaur Warrior for 5 mana, 3 red red. Whenever Sethron Herloon General or another non-token Minotaur enters the battlefield under your control, create a 2-3 red Minotaur creature token. Oh, and I mean, there's a little bit more. There's an activated ability of 2 black red hybrid, so... Three mana total. A Minotaurs you control get plus one, plus O, oh, and gain Menace and Haste until end of turn. I mean, I guess if we look down this list, see like what cards people are putting in. In general, there's a decent amount. For some reason, they love printing three mana Minotaurs. I'm not exactly sure mm -hmm. why that is the case. But we do end up with one Changeling in the high synergy area and a decent amount in the top cards. Um, and creatures played so yeah and, and not even specifically minotaurs even like metallic mimic is here grave shifter is here adaptive automaton is here changeling you are outcast yeah changeling outcast you are seeing these like cheap little minotaurs subsidized with these cheap little changelings yeah and i think that there are definitely characteristics of minotaurs that you could build around, um, build a commander around rather than just focusing on them entering the battlefield. They often have more toughness than power. That's kind of like something that was distinguishing them when they did the the Minotaur tribal in the original Theros block. So that's potentially a hook you can use mechanically. But yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that some of people's favorite Minotaurs may get pushed out for something that's just a little bit more efficient at netting that ETB trigger. What's the other commander that we're going to use to test this uh, hypothesis? Yeah, so the other one we're checking on is Tulsimir Friend to Wolves, 
This is from War of the Spark. He costs five mana, two green, green, white. He is a three, three elf scout. Uh, when Tulsimir, friend to wolves, enters the battlefield, create Voja, friend to elves, a legendary three, three green and white wolf creature token. Whenever a wolf enters the battlefield under your control, you gain three life and that creature fights up to one target creature you don't control. So this is a pretty strong ability. Basically, all your wolves kind of act as kill spells as well as wolves. And if they win the fight, they stick around to deal a bunch of damage. So when we look at this list, what we end up seeing is it takes a while, but you do get some changelings. And, and one of the reasons for that is it's very easy to get a ton of 2-2 wolves in one big go. So what happens is you start with kind of all those cards. You end up with wolf briar elementals. You're raised by wolves, your Keswick Cage Breakers, Howl of the Night Packs, and stuff like that. And as you keep going down the page, you start seeing the actual wolves in there, Wolf Your Avengers, Witch Stalkers, and then all of a sudden there's the Mirror Entity, and then all of a sudden you got your Irregular Cohort, and your Metallic Mimic, and your Adaptive Automaton, and kind of a very similar thing to the Minotaur list where it's kind of subsidizing in just a few of these changelings that are cheap and have an effect that kind of add to your game plan. Yeah, I think this is an interesting one because I, I went in just kind of looking at the qualities of the commander and thinking a little less about the qualities of the tribe. But I think this may actually be a case where one factor that contributes to the use of changelings is counteracted by another factor that disincentivizes the use of changelings which is that first thing we were talking about earlier, which is if there are lots of high quality, cheap options or efficient token generation, you're going to get less competition from changelings. So as, as you mentioned, there is a lot of good wolf token generation coming from your, uh, you know, your feed the pack, your wolf briar elemental, your Kessig cage breakers, your howl of the night pack. So as a result, you don't have to be as reliant on changelings in order to make this deck work. And I think there's one more category of things that kind of lead to changelings being better than they should be. Do you want to get into what this is? Yes, uh, this is, I think, the most egregious and something you really got to be careful about. Because I think with, with some of the tribes we've talked about earlier, the advantage of running changelings can be less obvious. But here, it's just like so clearly better to run changelings that you you would really have to be fooling yourself to not displace the members of your favorite tribe for those those little alien babies. This card is Rin and Sari inseparable. Or rather, this category is commanders that reward multiple tribes in a way that is additive. So there are plenty of commanders out there that will say like, you know, warriors, barbarians, and berserkers get plus two, plus two, and have haste. That doesn't necessarily push changelings above members of the actual tribe, because like, even though a creature might have changeling and, and be both a berserker and a warrior, it doesn't stack. It doesn't get plus four, plus four, and double haste. But if you design a commander in a way that makes it so that like tribe X gets this, and tribe Y gets this. And if you happen to be both tribes, then you get both of those bonuses. Well, then that's naturally going to lead to changelings getting an extra bonus. And so Rin and Sari, inseparable, is the commander, the, the only commander I could find that really fell into this category. But it's so devastating that I just had to bring it up. So Rin and Sari is one red, green, white for a 4 4 legendary creature, dog, cat. Whenever you cast a dog spell, create a 1-1 green cat creature token. Whenever you cast a cat spell, create a 1-1 white dog creature token. And then red, green, white, tap. Red and Sari inseparable deals damage to any target equal to the number of dogs you control. You gain life equal to the number of cats you control. So again, if this had been worded like whenever you cast a cat or dog spell, a 1-1 token, that would be fine. But because it's separated out those two abilities, any dog you could cast is going to be worse than a changeling of the same stats and mana cost. And ditto for, for cats. Because when you cast a changeling, you get both of those abilities. You get two tokens instead of just one. Looking at this list, in the like high synergy cards, you're going to see Mirror Entity. You're going to see Torian Mahler. And looking in the creatures... Uh, one of the most popular ones is Universal Automaton. 
And then, of course, you got a regular cohort, Imposter of the Sixth Pride, and a couple other changelings, including like Woodland Changeling, as you go down lower. So what are your thoughts on this type of design? So one of the things about this is that if they follow through and stick to their guns and print dogs, like actually go and print good dogs and good cats and like continue to do that, I think we will start to see less changelings. But I think it, it seems like it's more likely that we're going to get more good changelings over the years at a higher concentration. So like if you look at Kaldheim, Kaldheim gave us a bunch of good changelings in one set where we might get like one good dog or one good cat every now and then. I think it's just never going to add up to the point where changelings are not the best thing to do. That They're, they're just always going to give you two of the tokens. And as long as they keep printing them with like relevant abilities, then your cats and dogs are kind of going to sit by the wayside unless you're just doing it for the funsies, you know? Yeah, and it is especially unfortunate, I think, with this tribe over something like sphinxes or angels because i think that like rin and sari and like the push to add the dog creature type into magic was intended to pull in people who aren't necessarily into magic already or who aren't into fantasy it's like dogs are something that people really really love in the real world cats are something that people really really love in the real world and you can get people into the game by saying like hey you might not love fantasy card games but i know you love dogs so why don't you play this dog deck and see how you like it and see if you have fun and when you make it so that like running all your favorite dogs becomes less good than running purple jelly man or uh, mysterious mask man or uh, alien baby just all these different types of changelings that we've seen over the years then i think it's unfortunate and it makes it harder to pull people into the game through this commander. Yeah, and I think that just speaks to the larger changeling problem as a whole, which is just it takes away resonance. And it is cool that changelings exist. It is cool that they exist to subsidize things. And I like changelings. I like playing with them. I like being clever with them. But the tragedy of changelings is when they actually take away from a tribe or the identity of a tribe in commander, in the place where they're most likely to continually see play. Because I mean, if we look at, like, Sethron, Hurloon General, you're not going to play that in Legacy, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, no one is taking their Higure deck to their Star City Legacy Open and expecting to do well. They're taking non-tribal lists, lists that do things more competitively. So where these tribal designs kind of end up living is Commander, and it's always a shame when the Commander that is supposed to facilitate them kind of just falls flat. But I think that, like, with clever design with designs that really build around the characteristics of the tribe or that aim to encapsulate a tribe that already has a lot of powerful members that isn't going to see a lot of adoption of changelings. Wizards can avoid this type of problem and make it so that people are incentivized to play with the cards they really love instead of just the ones that are most efficient. Yeah, and that's that's the point. That's the goal. So, I mean, I hope this was an interesting look into tribal and changelings for those listening. It's I, I think there is a lot to learn about design from looking at this kind of topic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and with that, I want to give a brief thank you to our Patreon patrons. They are Bradley, Gustav, Ryan, Mark, Addison, Mason, Rick, Laser, Raphael, Kyle, Charlotte, Andrew, Tom, The White Clays, Aubrey, Hannah, Anthony, Andy, Dylan, James, Justin, Logan, Roger, David, Evan, Bryce, Dylan, Benjamin, Jason, Kyle, Jerry, Brandon, Eamon, Kevin, Matthew, Jamie, Russell, Kaidel, Jeremy, Walter, John, and John. Thank you all for supporting the show. If you are not currently a Patreon patron but would like to become one, please check us out at patreon.com slash commander theory. Thanks for listening. If any of you theorists want to get in touch with us, I am at Commander Theory on Twitter and Tumblr, and Zach is at Fat Bartleby on Twitter. Our theme song is Lincoln Continental by Entropy, and you can check him out on SoundCloud. Until next time, we're going back to the drawing board.